Being a prisoner of war under the authority of the Japanese was an appalling experience. POWs received no protection from the Geneva Convention. Men barely existed and the treatment meted out by the Japanese left mental scars that remain deeply ingrained still to this day. It's major, highly. He was very uh, erudite sort of a man, very, very superior type of man. Uh, a real academic, I think. His English is absolutely beautiful. And he said, gentlemen, uh, I need your attention right away. I'm afraid uh, things have turned very, very nasty. Uh, you're going to have to witness an execution. I implore you not to make any demonstration. Three of our men are going to be ex executed by the Japanese. Uh, we've been to the commandant, the Japanese commandant, the captain, and we pleaded and pleaded with him. It got to the stage that he began to beat up anybody who came to intercede on behalf of these three men. He said the sad thing is that they were not escaping. They were coming back in over the wire, having gone over the wire to go and see their wives. They weren't very far away. And he said, uh, we'll soon be put on parade. They're digging the graves now out on the football field behind the school. And um, please, as young men, aggressive young men, don't, please. It'll only be worse for everybody else if you do anything. So we were out in the field with the sergeant major of the Japanese, um, a real tough, because to be a sergeant major in the Japanese army, you've got to be a pig. And uh, he spent a long, long time putting us on three sides of a square with the other side of the square occupied by the three graves. But he put us in ranks of two and even had to spread them out so as he could accommodate just two ranks with the second rank being able to see through the shoulders. of He staggered the ranks, in other words. And um, he left a space on the right-hand side. We, I was in the middle of the, the square, right in the front of that middle. Uh, a middle square, and he left a space and about 12 very, very callow, very young uh, Japanese soldiers came to occupy that space. And they looked and acted terribly young. They couldn't have been more than 17. And we couldn't understand at the time why these boyish looking young fellows were about. Then in strolled this captain. Uh, he was impeccable. He had riding breeches and the jack boots, highly polished, uh, white gloves, white silk shirt, uh, and his samurai sword. And he was going to enjoy himself. And he strolled rather than marched on. And he, uh, a lieutenant, uh, came out and he had a scroll with him and he stood in the middle of the square and he unfolded the scroll like something he had seen in a film and he read out the sentence in Malayan and then in ja no, in Japanese first then in Malayan now I'm beside a fellow called Willie Seabold who was coal black from Suriname in South America which was a Dutch colony uh, he was 17 years old well educated, very well educated, and his Malay, he was translating out of the corner of his mouth. He said, uh, they have con been condemned for trying to escape. They are going to die by thrusting. He didn't know the word. They die by thrusting. Now, we'd been told they were going to be shot. So that's why we thought, we thought this group of uh, young soldiers were there as a firing party. Well, he read out the sentence, and... Um, by, the, by that time, of course, the three men had been prodded on, had been badly beaten up and they were tied behind. And they put one in front of his grave, uh, of each grave. And uh, we thought, well, this firing party's going to come out, there's nobody behind. But there's a, a sloping hillside and all the natives in the district, in the distance, were gathered. They knew there was something, t they knew, it. there was a grapevine. They were out to watch. And what sort of, sort of ironic, rather sickening thing, there was sort of gentle, tinkly music being played somewhere. You know these sort of east, far eastern sounds that you get, like little cymbals, 
and uh, sell cell phones. But somebody was doing that in a village somewhere close by. And here was this scene, uh, a really horrible scene, uh, with this complimentary sound in the background. And um, he called out, he just, the, he just did this, three very young fellas. We thought, well, they're not going to shoot them. Thrusting then became, we knew what it meant now. Uh, they were going to bane at them. Uh, they then had another young man come out and tried to put a bandage on the first guy and he refused to have it. And they just kept thumping in the back until he had to submit to the bandage. Each th all three had the bandage. The one in the middle, a uh, fair-haired Dutchman, uh, kept trying to put his hand in his pocket and he was shouting in, in Dutch and Willie Siebold was, he said, he's shouting he wants to give money for his wife before he dies. And uh, by then, of course, my mouth, I mean, dried up completely. It's really like watching an accident. You can't help watching. You can't help looking. I didn't want to look. I didn't want to see this. And uh, the guy beside me was, he, I could hear him breathing just as stertorously as I was breathing. It took such a time over it. Uh, this bloody captain, he took out his, uh, he had a tortoiseshell cigarette holder. Uh, put the cigarette in it and he's it up in the air and looking at us, you know, it was so orchestrated. He's so pleased with himself. This was all in the day's work. He'd probably supervised executions in China and other places. Well, he gave the order and instead of bayonet, bayonet, bayoneting them, they did bayonet drill, advance, retreat, advance, retreat. They did it every day. And when they did the thrust, when they're doing the practice drill, they screeched like banshees to make it sound awful. They did exactly the same. And they bayoneted each of these fellas in the stomach. That knocked them down, and they just kept sticking them on the ground. And um, they were still kicking when they just dragged them unceremoniously into the graves. And uh, the captain sort of turned around and looked at us took another puff out of his cigarette and uh, gave the order for dismiss.